everybody, and welcome to another episode of my JavaScript story. Uh, this week, we're talking to Ethan Brown. Ethan, do you want to say hello? Hi. Now, Ethan is the Director of Engineering at Value Management Strategies. Um, we had him on episode 333 of JavaScript Jabber, where we talked about the things you know, um, things you need to know, and a few you can skip um, in JavaScript in 2018. Of course, now it's 2019, so you have another version of this coming out? or <laughs> Yeah, it'll be a whole different list this year. <laughs> oh, really? Uh, such is the nature of the the beast as a matter of fact i I think when i did that episode i was referring to a talk i gave at node interactive the year before and already i was or an article i had i had uh, been interviewed for and already i had i had said well a couple of these things i said you didn't need to know now i think you do need to know and (laughs) (laughs) the, the ecosystem just changes so quickly yeah absolutely This episode is sponsored by Sentry.io. Recently, I came across a great tool for tracking and monitoring problems in my apps. Then I asked them if they wanted to sponsor the show and allow me to share my experience with you. Sentry provides a terrific interface for keeping track of what's going on with my app. It also tracks releases so I can tell if what I deployed makes things better or worse. They give full stack traces and as much information as possible about the situation when the error occurred to help you track down the errors. Plus, one thing I love, you can customize the context provided by Sentry. So... If you're looking for specific information about the request, you can provide it. It automatically scrubs passwords and secure information, and you can customize the scrubbing as well. Finally, it has a user feedback system built in that you can use to get information from your users. Oh, and I also love that they support open source to the point where they actually open source Sentry if you want to self-host it. Use the code devchat at sentry.io to get two months free on Sentry's small plan. That's code devchat at sentry.io. Um, and yeah, I think we talked about, you know, how you decided what things needed to go in the list and things like that. Um, but yeah, I, I kind of want to back up and get your story. You know, we're, we're here to talk about that, talk about you, uh, a little less about the, the article or the talk. So, um, how did you get into programming? Well, uh, I was, um, I was homeschooled. My sister and I both were homeschooled from an early age. My dad is an electrical engineer and mm-hmm. I thought I was going to become an electrical engineer and t- up until we got our first computer. Um, you know, before that I was twiddling around with breadboards and, you know, learning how to make things with digital ICs and stringing together resistors and capacitors and transistors and all that. <laughs> and then, uh, we that got was me in high school. Said, that, that's what I did. So I, I feel you. <laughs> Yeah. Um, and, you know, ironically now, you know, I guess the grass is always greener now. Sometimes I think, oh man, I wish I'd gone into electrical engineering. <laughs> um, but, you know, computers are great. And certainly, you know, when I was, when I was a kid and we got our first computer, I thought, oh, why, you know, why, why am I messing around with ICs when this computer, you know, this multi-purpose machine mm-hmm. will do anything I ask it to. Um, and I can't even remember what my first, you know, what you would call a computer is. I think it was one of those little NEC wedge shaped NEC things, uh, that I guess resembled the laptop of the day, but it's, you know, certainly nothing we would call a laptop today. Right. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, I wrote, wrote stuff in basic and I remember distinctly it didn't, it didn't have any kind of persistent memory, but you could back up your programs to, I'm not kidding, audio cassette tape. So there was a little acoustic adapter and, you know, it would play back like the modem sounds and you would record it on a cassette tape and then you could play the cassette tape back and load it into memory. It was, was, you know, (laughs) and now looking back at that, it's just so bizarre to imagine that we did things that way. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, of course, my dad, he worked with some of the early computers. And so I remember, I would remember him bringing home punch cards. And, you know, so it's, uh, it's a whole different era. Um, yeah. So, you know, that that's how I got started with programming. And then, you know, we got a PC relatively quickly, I guess, in the early, maybe mid 80s. Um, and, you know, I played around with whatever languages were available. I think Pascal was where I, I started most of my um, programming yep. education, uh, all the, Bor- the beloved Borland products <laughs> and, uh, good old days. Yeah. Right. 
Yep. Um, and I was, you know, I was precocious. I think, you know, one of the advantages of, of being a homeschooler in my generation was, was, um, you know, I, I'm among the first generation of instant, what I would call institutionalized homeschooling. I mean, obviously people have been doing it forever, but you know, when I was growing up, it was, it started to become a, you know, a thing that people were writing books about and there were communities and, you know, it was right. a little more in the social consciousness. Um, and so, you know, we had, we had a lot of opportunities and there was a certain, uh, I guess, impression that we were sort of wunder kids, which, you know, I don't know how well deserved that was, but that was sort of the, the impression. Um, but it did, it did have, you know, I, I did enjoy the nice opportunities. We, um, we sort of subscribe to the, the John Holt, you know, unschooling method where the idea is you follow less of a curriculum and you just explore whatever you want. And, you know, pr predictably, perhaps my sister explored arts topics and I explored computers and, you know, I had a lot of opportunity to really focus on that. Um, I, I sort of didn't, I maybe didn't get as much general education as I should have. Um, you know, I corrected that when I went to university, but uh, right, it, it was definitely an interesting way to do things. So, um, you know, the, the, the opportunity for me was, you know, my dad, uh, you know, he retired from the Navy. Um, he was on the engineering side mm -hmm. and uh, he started a company selling uh, video data collection um, electronics for scientists and engineers. And he needed some software written to collect some of that data for, you know, PC side processing. And so he asked for my help. And so, you know, my, my first commercial software was being sold when I was 16, which was, you know, pretty exciting. Wow. Uh, and, uh, you know, <laughs> an interesting way to get started. Um, you know, I look back now and it seems pretty small potatoes, but, uh, at the time I, I was proud of it. Yep. That's awesome. <clears throat> so you, you get in, you're, you're writing code. You said you went to university. Did you study computer science there? Or? I did, but there, uh, it, uh, there was, there was a gap. And as a matter of fact, I was just listening to the, the previous uh, episode with Charles uh, Lowell. Yeah. Um, and, you know, interestingly, he and I had, had some, uh, some overlap in our experience. I did go back to school, but, uh, you know, there's a little story in between there. So I was writing the software for my dad's company and he sold, uh, he was selling his devices to, um, a defense contractor in New Jersey. We were living in Virginia at the time. And, uh, they, uh, I can't remember how the conversation went, but I'm sure they were like, Hey, you know, we love your devices and, he got to talking about the software and it came up that, you know, I wrote it and they were like, Oh, would he like a job? So, uh, <laughs> at, at, at the young age of 17, I, I moved off to New Jersey, uh, to take a job as a, you know, quote unquote professional programmer. Um, and that was a wonderful experience. I got, you know, I got exposed to different languages. That's where I learned C plus plus. And I was working in an optical lab, which was really interesting. So I was doing a lot of hardware uh, interfacing. So there was a lot of uh, GPIB and um, and things like that, controlling uh, controlling hardware from from a PC. Um, and I did that for a couple of years, and you know I I started to notice that, uh, and this is definitely not the case now, but back then all of my peers had degrees in computer science and they were making significantly more money than I was. Um, and so I just sort of got the message that, you know, what, what you did to advance your career was um, go get a degree. Uh, so I did, I went back to university. Um, I, um, I was majoring in computer science and, you know, one of the, one of the questions I always get from prospective programmers is, do you really need to, you know, know math or be good at math to do programming. Um, and I sort of have a nuanced answer to that because I, you know, growing up, I hated math. I was, I was bad at it. I, I was frustrated by it. And as a computer science student, I had to take calculus, uh, you know, up to calculus. And so I was in this calculus class with nothing but bad experiences with math and having hated it the whole way. 
And I sort of had my math epiphany and calculus all of a sudden and started to come together and I got it. And all of a sudden trigonometry was making sense and algebra was making sense. And not only was it making sense, it actually became interesting. And then I took another math class and another math class and another. And then finally, at one point, my advisor was like, well, uh, you know, you're uh, just a few credits away from a math degree as well, right? Um, so I got, I ended up coming out of university with two degrees, um, which was, uh, you know, I was really proud of the math degree because even though I acquired a taste for it, I was never particularly good at it. And, you know, every B that I struggled for in a math class, I was way more proud of than the, than the A's I got in computer science. Yeah, I get that. The math classes were really hard. I was a computer engineering major. Mm -hmm. And so I had to take a few more math classes and a few more engineering classes and a few fewer computer science classes. But yeah, uh, yeah it definitely went through a lot of what you're describing. <laughs> um, the thing that I thought was funny is that um, if you, so computer science, there was definitely overlap with the math. Computer engineering, there was a ton of overlap with the math. And so right. you were like two classes away from getting a math minor. And um, of course, so that, that meant that I went and got me an Italian minor. <laughs> uh, I always thought it was funny. It was like, why go take the last two classes to get the math minor? If you graduate <laughs> with a computer engineering degree, they know you can do the math. So, right, right. But yeah, anyway. But yeah, that, that's, that's really interesting. So you have, you have degrees in both? Yes. Very cool. Um, have you been able to apply both? Well, certainly I've applied the computer science degree, you know, that, that's been my profession. And, um, you know, I, I take a pretty uh, philosophical approach to the, you know, debate about whether degrees in computer science are worth it or are they still relevant. Um, and I, I, I kind of feel like people are asking the wrong question. Um, certainly if, you know, if you don't, really care for formalized education and you don't want to be in a classroom and you don't, you know, sort of respect that system, you're probably not going to get out something out of a degree, but if you enjoy academics and you enjoy the, you know, academic environment and, and having professors and, you know, other people that are like-minded, then I think you get a, a ton out of a degree in computer science. And so, I think there's this, there's dialogue about, you know, oh, you want to be a programmer, should you bother with a degree in computer science? And, you know, my answer is that, well, it, it depends. It depends on you and what, what you like and what you're interested in. And of course, what your means, um, you know, I, I think the ascendancy of sco code schools is really indicative of the fact that a lot of people want to get into this field, but maybe don't have the, the resources or privilege to, you know, go get a four-year degree at a university. Yeah. I, I, for me, one of my big things, it's one of the values that we espouse at devchat.tv, but it's also, I mean, I get to set that because I own the company, but um, <laughs> it's interesting to me that, um, yeah, you know, we have the conversation about should, should people get four year degrees? And my, my question in return is what's the outcome you want? Right. You know, yeah, I, I think I think that's a great question, and that's you know some that's one of the questions you should be asking. Um, yep. For me, it was a no brainer. You know, I I really love being in an academic environment. It was you yep. know my, my my days at university were some of the the, the most fun in my life. Um, and you know, I I have a long term plan to go back and get a PhD and just sort of retire into teaching. So, you know, it 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 depends. It does exactly depend on what you're you're looking for. Um, and I, I would add to that, that, you know, going to university is not going to be the only way to achieve success as a programmer. If that's, you know, if that's what you want, if that's your objective, um, certainly you should look at computer science programs, uh, yeah. but it's not the only way. Yeah, exactly. I mean, and, and that's, that's kind of what I'm driving at when I ask, you know, what's the outcome, right? Because right. if you want the degree that you know then, <laughs> right. then that's the outcome right if you want the experience if you want the journey of going through college then yeah you know right i'm, I'm not going to argue with you you're getting the outcome you want yeah if you just want a job writing software yeah look at all the options and decide which one's going to get you there and get you the kind of job you want exactly and you know there are definite trade-offs there right 
So I think there are, there are also other options too. You know, I really think that there's some excellent master's options that you don't even need an undergraduate degree. So I know people who have, you know, started a programming career and they spent, you know, five years programming and then they sort of start to want to know more and, and understand things at a deeper level. And there are uh, really solid master's programs out there uh, for working adults who, um, who want to sort of get that deeper foundation. And then, you know, you're, you're getting a more impressive credential in the end. Yep. Yep. And again, you know, that's all down to the outcome you want. So exactly. Um, so anyway, when you graduated from college, um, how did you get your first job? Um, trying to remember. Uh, I remember what my first job out of university was. I was working for a defense contractor, uh, just outside of Richmond, Virginia. Um, and honestly, I don't remember how I got it. I, uh, you know, maybe I responded to uh, an advertisement in the newspaper or maybe it was a job fair. Um, I don't think it was a personal connection. I, you know, I know a, a lot of the jobs I've gotten in my life have been personal connections, but I don't think that one was. Um, that, was a, that was a great job. Um, we were doing load planning software for the joint DOD. So, um, you know, the, the military has a huge challenge and getting people and equipment from point A to point B. And um, the the company I was working for was doing the software that said, you know, oh, if you need, you know, this many tanks and this many Jeeps and, you know, this many portable generators and they all have these shapes and the way they can fit on the bed of a C-130 and, you know, how do you arrange them? So there was a lot of, you know, spatial organization. Uh, you know, it was actually graphical, which was really neat, uh, you know, for the time because that was, uh, nine, 1990, 1989, 1990. Um, mm -hmm. and so, you know, you could see the bed of the C-130 with the outlines of all the pallets that were laid down. So, um, you know, I really had a, a good, interesting first job out, out of college, um, doing some, some actual heavy lifting. That's cool. Yeah. So how did you wind up getting, um, from doing this kind of thing to, uh, JavaScript? You know, I was thinking about this uh, as I was um, getting ready to to do this interview. You know, I don't remember the first Java, you know, certainly I don't remember my first line of JavaScript or everything. Like a lot of people, um, I just sort of was, you know, in one way or another caught up in in web development work, whether it was you know, helping someone build their own website or uh, working on a web interface. I, you know, one of my, my very early jobs was working for Informix uh, when they were one of the four big database vendors. And they were working on a web-based admin interface for their databases. And so I worked on that team. So, uh, you know, it was, it was very gradual for me, the transition from desktop software to web-based software. It just, you know, I was doing more and more projects that were on the web. And of course, as, as that happened, I ended up doing more and more JavaScript. So um, it was kind of like, uh, you know, uh, the, the frog in the pot of water. I was, I was boiled by JavaScript <laughs> instead of thrown into the <laughs> boiling water. Um, and I was also trying to remember what my first Node application was. And that would have been at PopArt. So prior to the job I'm at now, I was working at a, uh, a marketing agency that had a focus on um, like web applications and mobile applications. And I sort of brought Node and JavaScript, uh, you know, as sort of as a JavaScript centric development stack to that company. Um, it, it was pretty uh, .NET centric before that. We were doing a lot of uh, ASP.NET and um, I certainly have no issue with, uh, with ASP.NET or C Sharp. I think C Sharp is a great language and I think you know, Microsoft looked at all the mistakes that Java had made and didn't make them. You know, they made their own mistakes, of course, but I don't think they were as entrenched in their mistakes as, mm -hmm. as um, Sun and later Oracle were. Um, so I didn't, I didn't, it wasn't as, as if I was fleeing .NET because I didn't like .NET. I was going to JavaScript because I, I really was intrigued by the, 
the focus of having one language on the front end and the back end. Um, you know, our, our jobs are so complicated and there, you know, there's so much you have to know. Any, any opportunity I saw to simplify the tools I use on a day-to-day -day basis was really valuable. Yeah. yeah, definitely interesting. So it sounds like you're using Node on the back end and, um, you know, JavaScript on the front end. What, what, what does your stack look like? So uh, you essentially uh, outlined it in a nutshell. Uh, we are on the AWS platform and we are doing all serverless right now. So all of our server side JavaScript comes in the form of AWS Lambdas. Oh, wow. Um, on the front end, it's all React and Redux. We're also using a library that uh, I, I believe I mentioned uh, the last time I spoke to you called Auto Merge. Uh, you know, which I guess fits somewhere in the panoply of state management libraries. Um, it's sort of an interest. Maybe I'd call it an adjunct to that, like you would use it in conjunction with a state management library. And interestingly, we may end up dropping it just because I don't, uh, you know, it's great for what it does, but I'm not sure it's going to get me to my long term vision of how we want to do state management. But that's neither here nor there. Um, and in terms of front-end libraries, we're also using Ant Design. Uh, you know, I've, I've always really liked Bootstrap. I like the simplicity of it. And as a primarily back-end person, I like that I can make things that don't look hideous relatively easy, easily. Um, the problem is it doesn't really offer a ton in terms of functionality. Like if you need a robust front-end. Right toolkit it doesn't give you much um so we went with ant design which is extremely robust not perfect uh, i'm not sure mm -hmm. anything in this space is um but it would have taken us years to write what it gives you out of the box so yep very cool so uh what have you done in javascript that you're particularly proud of i mean we ran across your you know javascript 2018 what do you need to know and what, what can you skip um, so it seems like most of at least what I've been able to find has been, you know, in the form of blog posts or talks. Um, is that primarily where you focus as far as what you do in the community or have I missed some open source somewhere? Or? Um, no, I haven't, I haven't, uh, I haven't hit it big in the open source, uh, space yet. Uh, you know, I, I would love to, I do have some ideas, you know, everybody and their brother, I think has ideas about, um, or their sister as ideas about state management these days. And I, right. I've got my own um, take on how that should be done. You know, the whole state management space is just so wild west right now. And it's interesting because all of them are good ideas. You know, you look at MobX and you look at, you know, Redux and you look at all, all the little flavors and variants and, you know, they've all got something to offer Apollo, you know, it's, it's, just, it's crazy out there. Um, and, you know, so I suppose it's not particularly original that I've got my own idea about how, how that all can work. Um, you know, the, the question is, am I, am I going to have the time and space to actually operationalize it and, you know, formalize it? And, you know, right. then, then the, the follow-up question is, will it be any good? Um, so, you know, I've contributed to a couple of larger uh, open source projects, but, you know, not to the not to the point that anyone would recognize my name in a commit log or anything. Right. Um, so, so yeah, cool. no, no, um, <laughs> no big open source credits yet. That's fine. I mean, I feel, and I, I feel like content sometimes gets downplayed. I mean, unless you go big, right. So, you know, I, I don't feel like I've been slighted, but JavaScript Jabber is a fairly well, receive show yeah absolutely um, but you know a lot of times you know somebody will write a blog post and you know it'll circulate among a few hundred or a few thousand people and you know it doesn't get the credit that open source gets or right. people writing documentation that doesn't get the credit that open source like writing the code gets but mm -hmm. without that stuff a lot of times people are lost right and so you know I, I like to highlight all of it um, and, and I'm curious with this too you know with speaking and 
um, writing. I mean, what, what are you generally aiming for? Are you trying to just help people figure out what direction to head in or are there particular topics you want to help make sure people understand better or? Well, um, it's an interesting question. I mean, obviously I like to hear myself talk, so uh, <laughs> I have that problem. Know, I'm not going to lie. Part of it is <laughs> ego fueled. It, you know, it feels good to be accepted, uh, to, to talk yeah. somewhere. It makes you feel like, you know, you, you, you know, know something. Um, uh, but you know, I put a lot of thought into, uh, what I pitch for talks, you know, you, you don't, nobody, I mean, I don't know, maybe if you're Dan Abramoff, people come to you and are like, you know, oh, hey, would you like to talk? But I have to work at it. I, I probably submit a dozen conference proposals a year to, you know, get the one or two that um, might actually be accepted. So uh, it's an interesting, that's an interesting process. I think the, the topics I've been successful in, you know, the talks that I have had, I, I've done a good job in recognizing what people are really interested in hearing about, mm -hmm. uh, which is a, a real tightrope because if you pick something too cutting edge, not enough people know about it for it to be interesting. And if you pick something too established, you know, everyone's tired of hearing about it. Right. So you sort of have to hit that sweet spot. And it was the same with pitching books to O'Reilly. You know, I really got lucky with Express because I just happened to be working with Express right at that sweet spot. And I said to right. them, hey, you know, look, you don't have a book on Express. And, you know, there are a couple that just came out and, you know, a lot more people are using it. So I just got really lucky with timing. Um, yep. So, you know, it's the same. It's the same with talks. You just have to, uh, you know, especially if you don't have a, uh, you know, if, if your name isn't followed by Microsoft or Facebook or GitHub or whatever, you know, I think the, I think if you work for one of the big companies, you have an easier time landing conference talks. Um, you know, yeah. Not, I mean, it still depends on, I don't know. It, it there, there are still things that, you know, because Microsoft may or may not promote you. Right. I mean, it, it adds credibility to a certain degree, but yeah. 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 And, and in no way am I trying to slight the the people who work at those companies who do get talks. I mean, you know, they're, they're there for a reason and, and generally they're talking about really interesting stuff. So they're doing their homework too. Yeah. Uh, I just think they have a little bit of a leg up. Uh, due to yeah. The recognition. Well, they also have a leg up because typically they're the people who are working on or with directly with, the technologies or the teams that build the technologies that people want to hear, hear about. Right. Exactly. And so it's, it's mostly a level of access thing, but yeah. So what are you working on these days? Well, we have a, a big project right now for a, a, a public sector client, um, uh, which I'm not going to talk too much about. Um, Fair enough. But we, um, you know, the, the, the interesting challenge we're facing right now as a company is, you know, we, uh, VMS is a, uh, an established company with a good revenue stream all on the professional services side. So we're really, really trying to uh, do a startup within an established com company, which is a really interesting model. It's nice that, you know, we have a stable company to, you know, pay our salaries uh, and we're not diluting you know, as a company, we're not diluting our equity because we don't need VC, but it comes with its own challenges and trying to um, do software. Well, I'll, I'll just, I'll just say that there are, there are definitely different challenges in that, in that environment. And like anywhere else, you, you have to think hard about, you know, what's, what's worth pursuing and how much time and effort you can dedicate on things. There's always pressure to deliver. Um, the, the interesting thing about the project we're working on is one piece of software. It's sort of this mm -hmm. monolithic application that uh, I guess you could say is in the information logistics space. It's about, you know, making better decisions and it's about uh, risk analysis. And so if you're, if you're trying to make complicated decisions, you know, VMS pro is, is, is really geared towards helping you with that. And 
we we have a client right now who's doing something that's you know there's a lot of overlap with that and they came to us and said hey uh you know we we've worked with you as a consultant we really love your work and we have this problem you'd like to solve and we looked at it and we said oh well there's a lot of overlap with what our software does so we're going to take our product and we're going to augment it with those features and so we're we're essentially uh getting paid a little bit to um help develop functionality on our own project which you know again it's an interesting business model and um, you know, I have an MBA too. And one of the things we talked about a lot is the importance of sort of hybridized business models. You know, the business world is so complicated mm-hmm. these days. It's really hard to succeed in a crowded business environment. If you're, if you just have a, a single business model. And so right. developing hybrid models is really um, a, a key to innovation oftentimes. So I know that's all very vague, <laughs> yeah. Uh, but this is also isn't a, a business show, so I don't want right. to really get too far in the weeds on that. No, it's all good. Um, one other thing, um, I was at a podcasting conference this last week. In fact, I, I uh, the plane landed at like midnight <laughs> last night. So, um, but yeah, uh, one of the things I was in a session where they were talking about interviewing people, and one of the questions that somebody brought up and I don't remember exactly where, but really intrigued me. So I'm going to ask this, even though it wasn't on the list of questions I sent you is um, in your career, is there a turning, was there a turning point for you at any point where things changed or a struggle that you had to overcome um, that you think people would benefit from hearing about? Sure. Um, The one that comes to mind for me was uh, I was working at Oracle and I, uh, I've heard of I, them. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I crossed the tracks to take a job in the QA department as a senior QA engineer. I was sort of interested to sort of round out my experience in the dev world, um, uh, with, with the idea that it would make me sort of a, a better more holistic, uh, developer. Mm-hmm. And that part of it was fine. I mean, I'm, I'm glad I got some exposure to the the work that QA entails. But what was really difficult about that experience was that we were, I was working on a, a project with a large team and that project never saw the light of day. We probably worked on it for a year and a half. I mean, people had been working on it for six months before I showed up and then I worked on it for a year And then Oracle acquired a company and it made the project we were working on redundant. And so Oracle said, well, we're going to cancel that project. And so in a lot of ways, I felt like I had a year and a half of my efforts just flushed down the toilet. And, you know, Mm -hmm. I mean, this happens in business. It's not, it's inevitable. And so I'm not, you know, crying over it. Uh, But it did really underscore to me how important it was to, you know, not just work for the paycheck because the paycheck from Oracle was great. I'm not, <laughs> not going to lie about that. And the benefits were fantastic. Uh, but for me, it really, it drove home that it was about them being connected to what we're trying to do. And I, and uh, even if, even if that project hadn't been canceled, I didn't really have a passion for what we were trying to do. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I cared, you know, I was trying to be a good crafts, right. craftsman, but um, like it wasn't, you know, something that really motivated me. Um, So after, after that job, I, um, I sort of twiddled around doing sort of private contracts for a while. And um, I was definitely in a funk. I wasn't, you know, I was, I was thinking about leaving software engineering altogether. I thought about, uh, you know, like going into something like law enforcement where I felt like I, I could have a direct impact on the community or you know right. do something more helpful or beneficial to society um and i ended up in <laughs> i i guess it it seems weird but i ended up in a uh, at pop art the marketing company and you know you might think oh wow you were looking for something meaningful and you went to a marketing company um and i, I while that that may seem contradictory you know, it was, it was a good company trying to do good things, which I appreciated. And then the thing, there were two things that really drove my, or reignited my passion for software development. 
One is because we were a marketing agency, there were a lot of creative types there. We worked with you know, graphic designers and uh, UX designers. And there was just a lot more focus on creative energy, which was really invigorating. And then also, uh, I don't know if you've ever worked in the agency world, but one of the things that, that marks the agency world, I think, is the pace of work. There's no Oracle-like year and a half projects that you can just can. <laughs> um, <laughs> so know, true. Have, yeah, my first, my first job was at an agency. Yeah. You have like two months to launch a website and then, you know, you've got a mobile app to deliver in a month and then three more websites in the next three months. And yeah. It just has to get done. And, you know, the downside, of course, is there's no time for, you know, real thoughtful engineering and you're not, you know, building things to last or, you know, being really innovative in architecture or anything. You're, you're leveraging tools to get a job done. Um, and, you know, while it ended up becoming tiring and I wanted to, you know, do really um, good sound engineering uh, after a few years, at first it was, it was great. And it was such an anodyne to the sort of slug like pace of big companies. And it was just great doing things mm -hmm. and getting them out the door and seeing them in the world. It was, it was uh, almost intoxicating. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I was freelance for six years, but yeah, my first job was at an agency. One of the things that drove me crazy was that people would pay me <laughs> insane amounts of money and then never launch. <laughs> <laughs> and so I definitely identify with that. And then, yeah, at the same time, it's like, man, look at, you know, look at what we made right. in like two months. So, yeah. 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 It's nice to get something done. <laughs> yep. Very cool. Well, um, the, the last thing I'm going to ask you before we get to picks is um, where do people find you online? Uh, so I have a Twitter handle at uh, Ethan R. Brown. Uh, I don't tweet a ton, but you know, if, if I'm ever at a conference or anything, or I come across interesting links, uh, Twitter is usually the, the best place to look for me. Uh, our, um, you can, you can check out my professional profile at the VMS website. That's vms-inc.com. And, you know, obviously if you, uh, search for Ethan Brown O'Reilly, you'll, you'll find my books. And, um, I am working on a second edition of web development with Node and Express, uh, which I believe we're planning on being out, uh, this fall. Uh, so nice. Look for that. Cool. Yeah. I put a link in the chat, which will go into the show notes for the earlier edition, but yeah, folks hold off. <laughs> <laughs> there, there's it's also a new edition JavaScript. If you're, if you're, uh, really dying to read one of my books <laughs> and that's current. Nice. All right. Well, um, do you have any picks for us? Uh, <laughs> I was also thinking about this before uh, a meeting with you and I was like, gosh, I, I can't think of any picks other than the things I, I gave you last time. So, you know, again, I'll, I'll plug Cooper press. I really think those guys do a great, they, they'll do a better job than I will of being able to pick anything you know, look through their list of publications, subscribe to the ones uh, that interest you. I subscribe to uh, React Weekly and um, mm -hmm. I, I can't remember what the name of the server, serverless one is, um, and JavaScript Weekly. And, um, you know, every week I find something interesting to read. So, um, you know, props to those guys and the work they're doing. Um, and uh, just because I don't have anything great, I'll, I'll throw out a... a a sort of fun one. I really have enjoyed um, regex crosswords a lot. So there's a whole website developed, uh, devoted to regex crosswords. And so if you want to waste a few hours uh, solving little interesting regex puzzles, then uh, just Google regex crosswords and it'll be that entertaining. That sounds so fascinating. <laughs> nice. Um, I'm going to jump in here with a few picks of my own. So one is, and I can hold it up to the camera for Ethan, but no one else to see it because I haven't been publishing the videos. But uh, it's called the, the, what is this, the Power List. Um, and it's put together by the MF CEO Project, which is a podcast done by a guy named Andy Frizzella. Um, it's a podcast that I listen to. Um, but essentially what it is, is it gives you, um, it's a journal. And it gives you one page where you write down the five things you're going to do to win today. And then on, on the other side, it's just an area for notes. But if you get all five things that you put down, uh, then you win. And the other thing, and, and there's not really any literature in the, 
in the journal. I mean, that's pretty much it. Um, oh, it is. It's right here at the beginning. It says, and I'm just going to read this real quick. It says, once a task has been on your power list for 21 days straight and been completed all 21 days in a row, it is considered a habit that you will complete automatically and must be dropped from the list and replaced by, by a new critical task. So my first two things are things that I'm trying to get in the habit of doing. And so um, one of them is running. And I've been, I've been training for a marathon. I've talked about that on the show before. Um, but another one is uh, just getting back on keto and doing that right. Uh, to get my diabetes under control. And really the goal there is to um, qualify for affordable term life insurance. Cause I just, if something happens to me, I, I don't want to leave my wife high and dry. So with five kids that would suck. So anyway, um, so yeah, so that's one pick. And then um, yeah, the other pick that I have, and I, I mentioned PodFest at the last um, uh, on the last episode of this show, which I actually recorded like two hours ago. Um, but, uh, one thing that came out of it and I'm just going to call out a couple of these things. Um, and this is something I'm going to be doing. So keep an eye out on my Twitter feed and things like that. But, um, people were talking at PodFest about audiograms and what they are. They're one minute videos that you can post to social media. Um, and of course I, I produce a little bit of audio, you know, throughout the week. So, um, you know, I thought, oh, well, that, that's perfect because it's, you know, you can kind of get a gold nugget out of, the, um, out of the show and then you, you know, you can share it on social media. And so what you do is you pull it out, get some graphic to go on it. You can um, animate it if you want. And then you put it up on social media. And people are more likely to watch a one minute video than an hour and a half video or an hour long video, you know, with the podcast artwork. And, you know, and so then they can click through and it can, you know, hey, subscribe or hey, you know, listen to the episode or whatever. So um, I'm going to be doing that. The tools that they um, mentioned, so I, I better link all this stuff. Um, so audiograms and then uh, the tools that I was told to use, there are companies out there that will just do them for you. There were like three of them at podcast or at PodFest, um, but it, you know. I'll just hire somebody and teach them how to do it. So one of them is called Snappa. And it's a really simple um, uh, editor. Uh, what is it? Image editor. But it, it's made for these kinds of um, media. And so, you know, it, it kind of gives you a place to write captions and things like that. And then the other one, um, and this is one that will help you publish it once you've written it, is Wave. And it's W-A-V-V-E dot C-O. And we'll have links to them in the show notes. But yeah, so the, that's what people have told me to use. And, uh, you know, I think between the two, the subscription across both of them is like 30 bucks a month. So really, really approachable. So if you're doing content, you know, there's some stuff. I am seriously considering starting a podcast about doing podcasts. <laughs> um, I've also been talking to um, some folks and it also looks like we're going to be launching shows over the next few months. Um, and, and these, these are ones that actually have traction, you know, so it's gone beyond just an idea. One is open source uh, sustainability and maintainability. And the other one is data science. So if you are interested in either of those topics, then keep an eye out on devchat.tv um, as we get those launched. But yeah, that's pretty much it. Those are my picks. So yeah. So thanks for coming, Ethan. Yeah, absolutely. Nice picks. Uh, we'll go ahead and wrap this up, and we will be back next week. Bandwidth for this segment is provided by Cashfly, the world's fastest CDN. Deliver your content fast with Cashfly. Visit C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com to learn more.